So, welcome everybody. My name is Tatiana Bazzichelli. I'm the director of the Disruption Network Club. And I'm really happy to welcome you at our 13th conference, Hate News, Manipulators, Trolls and Influencers. And uh, first of all, as usual, I would like to thank my wonderful collaborators because it's uh, thanks to them that we have this event as well. And I want to mention them, uh, Kim Foss, Nada Bakker, Ryle Verer, and also Jonas Franke. So please uh, make a great applause to them. And so, what are we doing here today? I mean, the topic of our conference uh, wants to investigate online opinion manipulation, strategic hate speech, and also misinformation. And at the same time, as usual, uh, trying to uh, investigate what is the result uh, and the impact uh, on civil rights. Um, we are funded by the Senat Verwaltung for Kultur und Euro, Europa, uh, for the English speakers is the Senate Department for Culture and Europe, Berlin, uh, from the Riva and David Logan Foundation, from the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation, and also we are working in partnership with the Friedrich Hebert Stiftung. We have our cooperation with the Kunst and Kreuzberg Betanien and also Spectrum, where we will do our event on Sunday. And uh, we have also collaboration with the Wow Holland Stiftung, the Rogue Agency for Open Culture and Critical Transformation, the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and our media partners are Ex Berlin and, and Furter Field. So, by preparing these events, uh, we have been thinking a lot about these topics, and in a sense, uh, the idea would be to try to connect two important aspects. One is the opinion manipulation uh, online, and the other is the hate speech. And sometimes uh, we will realize also during these conferences that these topics are often connecting. So they are kind of uh, the sides of the same coin. Um, and so we want to answer to some specific question. For example, what is the relationship between the deliberate spreading of hate online and political manipulation? How does the production of misinformation influence us? What is the ideology behind the hate speech? What are the technological responses to these phenomena in the context of the battle for civil rights? And so we have, uh, as you know, probably since you are here, a program of two days. Uh, today we are uh, first uh, um, reflecting uh, on, the, on the misinformation ecosystem in Kenya. Uh, and uh, later we will have a panel about Cambridge Analytica and also the behavioral profiling on social media. While tomorrow, instead, we are speaking mostly on the discourse of hate speech, of uh, online harassment, and at the same time, also the countermeasure to that. For example, also how to protect people in the uh, context of hate speech and also uh, harassment. And as usual, in the Disruption Network Club, we have people that are not only commenting on the subjects, but are also really working within them. They are trying to figure out problems. They are trying really to, from the inside, have a perspective uh, to inform the public and also trying to uh, all together figure out form of awareness and new form of knowledge together. So I'm really happy to start introducing now our keynotes so that uh, uh, as the title Between Hate and Hope, Lesson from Kenya on Hate Speech and Political Manipulation on the Internet. We will have with us Nanjala Niabola that is coming from Kenya. And I really want to tell you and really deeply thank her because I think everybody should also know that uh, she has been traveling the whole night to come here. And so, I mean, I'm so proud that she managed to come and be with us. We had you know, some issues as usual with visa that always happen. And so, so I really want to deeply thank you, Najala, for making it, you know. And so, thanks. 
so yeah, you, you are kind of my hero today. I just wanted to say that. Uh, but I want to introduce also the moderator of Anna Jala that is going to have a presentation of 10 minutes before our keynote. Um, she is uh, Jo Havman. We have a partnership with them because she's working, as I say, um, at the Rogue Agency for Open Culture and Critical Transformation. At the same time, Jo is also a trainer and consultant in science communication and management, as well as development uh, cooperation. Um, and uh, she's also uh, a board member of the Social Innovation NGO Global Innovation Gathering. So we saw together that was the perfect uh, context, uh, uh, the keynote of Najala, also to start uh, speaking about what they do at the Rogue Agency, because at the moment they are also working with hate speech, especially they work uh, in South Sudan, uh, and they are launching their campaign uh, in these uh, days, months, uh, she will tell us. Uh, so I want to leave the stage to you, you will tell us what uh, you are preparing at the moment also to battle this kind of problem and then we will go on with Najala. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Hello everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm here for, as a representative and team member of Broke Ag Agency for Open Culture and Critical Transformation. We are a Berlin-based nonprofit organization and work in um, like four people in critical situations, like for example in South Sudan. One of our projects um, is called DeFi Head Now, the biggest project that we have launched in 2015 and is still ongoing until the end of the year. It's called DeFi Hate Now and it's particularly tar um, targeting the issue that we talk about today and throughout this event. Um, so Divide Now has the aim of combating online hate speech and also mitigating incitement to offline violence in South Sudan. We have teams, not only in Berlin, um, where our headquarters or the office is based, but we also have a team in Kenya, Nairobi, that manages the online presence of the project and also does offline events. Um, the, obviously, we also have an office with a team in Juba in South Sudan and also in Uganda, um, where we collaborate and work with refugees mostly in the refugee camps across Uganda. So, next slide, please. And one of the campaigns or the initiatives that arose out of DeFi Now and was also um, developed by our team members in the respective countries is Think Before You Click. So, that came out of a workshop that we had with our team colleagues in South Sudan and the other teams. And think before you click is basically, you can already guess what it means and the idea and message behind is not to take anything that you find online as a fact or take it for granted, but check for fact news, be aware of that something, be aware of that something like fake news exists and that people try and um, spread something like hate news or um, yeah, basically spread lies on the internet. So. Not everything that we read and hear is true, obviously. And it's one thing to be aware of that, another thing to act on it, but also liking and sharing is endorsement and gives those initiatives or those news, so to say, or these um, online presences more present, more vibe. Next slide, please. Um, so these are just, um, like, we also do radio interviews. Sorry for the echo. <laughs> um, in Juba and, or in South Sudan, in Uganda, and Kenya, and there's offline events. We had just finished a series of trainings um, across the, several, yeah, the three countries. We're also going to have an event in Egypt where we also reach out to the diaspora or the South Sudanese diaspora there. Um, yeah, and it's basically how we engage with the people in the different regions. And now we have a, also we developed a music video which I'd um, like to share with you as an introduction also for Nanjalo's talk. So, enjoy. Your commitment and leadership is essential and this song is dedicated to you who wants to change the world around you. Defy it now. Do you want to be a leader? Yeah, you got to be a leader. 
Yeah. Being fair and respectful. Social media be your own pull. Because togetherness, you know we can rule. We can rule. We can rule. Be fair and respectful. Social media be your own tool. Positivity, you know you can rule. You can rule. You can rule. Yeah. You gotta be political conscious. In every post, yeah. Think before you click. Before you click. So you gotta think before you click. Before you click. And verify it on time. Your every tweet, your every post must be positive and courteous. Your every tweet and your every post must be positive and courteous. Yeah. Be smart. Be professional. You better be smart. Professional. You gotta be political conscious. Thank you. So the artist you saw is Free Boy, the African boy, and yeah, he's an Ugandan young aspiring artist and waiting for your bookings. <laughs> um, and also one of our team members, we are very proud of him. And yeah, this and also a, a film um, which is called Defy, it was produced locally with the local teams and you can find more on our website. But now let's come to Nanjala Nyabola. Would you like to join me on stage? <laughs> Well, have a sip of water first. <laughs> so Nanjala is a Kenyan. She's a political analyst, writer, and humanitarian advocate. Also a frequent speaker on international conferences, like this one, where she most often talks about contemporary African politics and society. Um, during your studies, <laughs> um, she focused on um, forced migration in Africa, and you got two master's degrees from Oxford University and also a jur Juris Doctor from Howard Law School. Um, okay, so as a writer, obviously, you publish both in academic and non academic journals and outlets, and, and many of them are probably known by all of us in the audience Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Al Jazeera, The Guardian. BBC Focus on Africa magazine, um, Pambazuka Press, and the New Africa magazine. Um, currently, you conduct um, independent research on politics and society. You also published or contributed as a co-author to two books. One is the Africa's media, or with a, one of the books titled "The Africa's Media Image in the 21st Century," and the other one, "African Women Under Fire." And now you're. Um, waiting for the release of your own book. Next slide. Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, and that's 
um, like the perfect match again to this event and probably also most of the content for your keynote for today. Um, so yeah, how does politics influence technology or vice versa? And we're very much looking forward to your input. Welcome, Nanjala. Thank you. Please forgive the poor graphics. We were trying to decide what was the best style. Um, and we obviously, I think we did OK. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Joe said, my name is Nanjala. I'm a Kenyan writer, political analyst. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about politics. And I know this conversation is supposed to be about technology, but I want it to be very grounded in um, politics because I believe that this artificial separation between the tech space, what happens in the tech space, and what happens in the political space is part of how we get in trouble. And we end up talking past each other instead of talking to each other and, and building a meaningful dialogue. Um, to give you a little bit of background, um, when they first asked me to give this presentation, I actually hesitated. And Tatiana said, you know, uh, we want you to come and speak at this conference. And I said, uh, you know I'm not a techie, right? <laughs> um, and she goes, yeah, I know you're not a techie, but the work that you're doing is very much what we want to talk about, which is hate speech and misinformation and this misinformation, misinformation ecosystem, which is what my book is about. It's basically about this tradition of misinformation that is rooted in propaganda and all of these, uh, what you would call, today we're calling fake news and what 50 years ago we would have just called propaganda and the impact that it has on the political decision making of individuals, of institutions, um, of the state. Um, my background is in political science and legal philosophy, um, but it didn't take me long, it didn't take long to persuade me to participate because I'm very much in the tradition of Edward Said, who is, I call him my brain crush, um, a thinker that I, I emulate, and, I, and I, I think that a lot of us could learn a lot from. And what he, please don't be too grounded in the slides, they're just really guide, <laughs> guidelines, but Edward Said talks about the amateur and interdisciplinarity, and the fact that we all can learn so much from borrowing from each other's disciplines. And that's the approach that I take in my work. It's not necessarily that um, because I'm a political scientist, I can only make reference to what's happening in political science, or because you work in technology, you can only think about what's happening in technology, but rather the ability to move between disciplines and the ability to move between um, approaches is where we find our greatest strengths. And so that's kind of where I want us to start from, is this is going to be an interdisciplinary uh, talk, this is gonna be an, an amateurish, which is not to say someone who doesn't know anything, but rather someone who is um, moving between various disciplines as opposed to remaining grounded in just one. So here I am, an amateur, entering the temple quite literally with a few things to say about hate speech and the role the internet is playing in my country in enabling um, or reducing its dissemination. First, a couple of definitions. What is hate speech? I don't know. The Oxford English Dictionary defines hate speech as abusive or threatening speech or writing that expresses prejudice against a particular group. Merriam-Webster kind of borrows from the same ideas, speech that is intended to insult, to offend, to intimidate a person because of some trait, race, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, and disability. It's important to get the definition straight because in this era of censorship, in my country, censorship is such a big deal. It's very easy to confuse speech that hurts people's feelings, that makes people uncomfortable with hate speech. In my country, we're having this problem right now with, with um, government censorship in an unpredictable way, where we have a film, for example, that was produced about a lesbian relationship and the government censor has banned it in Kenya because they say that the content of the film offends the moral sensibilities of Kenyan people. And this is why it's really important to separate how hate speech makes people feel from what it is actually trying to accomplish. The key things that these definitions have 
It has to be speech. It has to be a form of communication. Having an idea, to me, and like I said, moving between disciplines from a legal perspective, a person who thinks negatively about someone, that's not hate speech. It's bad, it's offensive, it's rude, it's how dare you. It's not hate speech. It's the act of communication, of transmitting that message that then enters us into the realm of speech. And you'd be surprised, from a constitutional perspective, speech is one of the most litigated things out there. In the US, one of the cases that people might know very well, the Citizens United case that allowed people to give money to political parties, was about, is giving money to people speech? And the court said yes, because if you give money to an organization, you're endorsing that organization. And that act of endorsement is free speech, and therefore you should be able to endorse anyone. And that's a long rabbit hole that basically ends with the argument that that's how American politics got ruined. Um, you have to be expressing a negative opinion or a derogatory opinion. Um, the speech itself is designed to offend. Oh, I've lost a word there. Um, and the basis of that derogation is a physical or social trait. Race, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, and disability. Why are we linked to these particular categories? Why do we have these protected categories? It's the recognition that hate speech is also a function of power. These are the categories throughout time that have been used to otherize, to exclude, to punish people, to have social violence against people. And so we recognize that when there's a situation of power disparity, we want to protect people who are at the most vulnerable and uh, most likely to be impacted. Um, when we say race here, I would say ethnicity in the broader terms. And that has very important implications in my country. So why does hate speech matter? I think it's really important to underline this. We don't regulate hate speech because it hurts people's feelings. We regulate hate speech because it creates in a conditions or environment in which social, political, economic violence is feasible. We regulate hate speech because it affects the way we think about protected groups and the way we think about individuals and therefore the way we respond to the threat of social, economic, political violence against them. If I called anyone in this room a cockroach right now, you'd probably go, okay, Nanjala, that's weird. But you'd shrug it off. And yet here is a Rwanda sending a man to jail for life because he made a speech in which he referred to Tutsis as cockroaches and popularized the idea of Tutsis in Rwanda as cockroaches that must be exterminated. He was a very senior party official at the time. And this idea was picked up by the radio and became pervasive and arguably for many people was a triggering factor in the subsequent genocide in Rwanda in which one million people were killed over a three month period. It's about power, it's about the conditions that are created and the impact that that has on power relations in that society. That's the key thing, because I think when we talk about hate speech on social media, a lot of the digital companies that run these, of the companies that run these platforms try to shrug us off and say, especially when it comes to misogyny and homophobia, and they say, well, just because it hurt your feelings doesn't mean that it's a big deal. And we're not saying stop allowing people to hurt our feelings on social media. We're saying stop creating an environment, an enabling environment for the kind of social, for the kind of violence that women, that people with disabilities, that ethnic minorities, when a president calls Mexican immigrants animals, which is what happened last week, what kind of violence is he enabling? Okay, so I've been using, or I'm, I, we often, I've been using the words technology interchangeably the words of social media. My presentation focuses very much on social media. And why is that? This is an emerging space in Kenyan politics. Over the last um, 10 years, my study, the, what's covered in the book, starts in 2007 and goes all the way to 2017. Why, that's such a random number, isn't it? It's not. Um, I call this Kenya's first digital decade. And 
Kenya's digital development is very much anchored in the political violence that we endured in 2007 and 2008. I don't know how many people are familiar with what happened in Kenya in 2008. Just... <laughs> um, in 2007, Kenya had a very contentious general election. Um, December 28th, we voted. December 29th, everything was calm, everyone was quiet, everyone was in their homes waiting for the results. When we went to bed on December 29th, the leader of the opposition was leading by over one million votes. When we woke up in the morning on the 30th, the lead was down to a couple, about 10,000 votes. And we had no idea what had happened overnight because obviously counting had stopped because people went to sleep. Um, and then by the evening of the 30th, people had gone out to the streets to protest. And there was retaliation by the police officers, by the army, the first time that we had the military deployed in the cities in Nairobi since independence, um, since 1982 rather. Um, and between December 31st and April 30th, 1,500 people were killed um, and over 100,000 were displaced. That's just the highlights version of what happened in Kenya. But that is what triggered the digital revolution in Kenya. Twitter was founded in 2006. Um, Safaricom, M-Pesa, how many people here are familiar with M-Pesa, which is the mobile money platform in Kenya? Yeah, I can see some hands. Um, M-Pesa was founded in 2007, just before the post-election violence. And oh, because of the interference, the state's interference in the traditional media, a lot of people went online and websites, blogs, social media became the primary source of information about what was happening in the country, especially with the diaspora. So we had 2.2 million Kenyans living outside the country by this time. Why is this important? Because the diaspora is what really drives the impact of social media on Kenyan politics. It changes power, it changes the conversation. Suddenly, people who are in Boston and in London and in, not so many in Berlin, but a couple <laughs> in Berlin are having these very highly political blogs that are covering stories that the media in Kenya would not cover. And the media would not cover them because one of the consequences of the post-election violence is that they were told, it's your fault that the country blew up because you are the ones who are telling people that they, the election, that they have to go out and this is a make or break election. And this is what I call the misinformation ecosystem. Because the number one purveyor of this misinformation in Kenya has never been social media, has always been traditional media and their relationship with the state. It's important to keep these things in mind when we think about the connections between social media and hate speech um, in Kenya. Because the failures of the traditional media have driven so many people online. Today in Kenya we have... Uh, population estimate 48 million. Oh, I've lost a couple of numbers. Registered voters in 2017, 19 million. Estimated Facebook users, 8 million. Estimated Twitter accounts, 750,000. Estimated WhatsApp users, 10 million. The percentage of people connecting on the internet through computers is only 12%, but internet penetration is at 38.8%. Um, and mobile phone penetration in Kenya is 88%. It's the second highest in Africa after South Africa in Sub-Saharan Africa, after South Africa. It's the second highest number of Facebook users, it's the second highest number of Twitter users, it's the second highest number of WhatsApp users. It's not all South Africa, some of it is Nigeria. It's Nigeria and South Africa who come first, so it's, it's not all South Africa. Um, so, the information ecosystem that I'm talking about starts with the 2007 election and the media, traditional media, taking a step back from its public information role because they're afraid, because they've been accused of being the ones who are disseminating this hate speech, because their job of covering political campaigns is interpreted as the fuel that's driving 
the political violence that drives millions of people online. And the millions of people who go online are not living with the same, are not doing their work with the same standards of rigor that you see in the traditional. There's no fact checking on Facebook. There's no fact checking on, on Twitter. There's no research. It's, I have a feeling, I saw, and I put it out there. The reason why my speech or my presentation is titled Between Hope and Hate, or Between Hate and Hope, is because the outcome cuts both ways. The good news is the millions of Kenyans who are online have become the singular most powerful force in political accountability in Kenya's history. On Twitter, we call ourselves KOT, Kenyans on Twitter. If you go on Twitter right now, there is an active campaign because we had a corruption scandal that was exposed on Monday. Today is Friday, right? I haven't slept at all. <laughs> um, um, there was a corruption cam uh, that, uh, scandal that was exposed on Monday and by Tuesday there was a hashtag, and the hashtag is trending in the country, and people are calling for a protest that's supposed to happen on Tuesday. This would never have happened more than 10 years ago. And it's not that we didn't have political protests, it's not that we didn't have some kind of political mobilization, but the speed at which people are mobilizing, the connections that are being made that transcend ethnic boundaries, that transcend age boundaries, that transcend even regional, although with a caveat that most social media users in Kenya are in Nairobi and Mombasa. Um, it's creating new ways of being and belonging in the country in unprecedented and unexpected ways. KOT is, has been responsible for, there's a hashtag called someone tell, call, someone tell CNN. When CNN pub, uh, broadcast uh, information about President Obama's visit, and he caught the, the, you know, the Chiron, the thing on the screen that scrolls past said, Kenya, um, what does it call it? Hotbed of terror. Obama scheduled to visit hotbed of terror. And KOT responded with the hashtag, someone tell CNN. And it was so heavily used that the CEO of CNN had to fly to Nairobi to apologize. It, allow, it has allowed us to take back the narrative, and we talk a lot about who gets to tell the story of Africa, who gets to tell the story of Africa, and when, and where, and how. Social media has allowed Kenyans to claim that space back. It's allowed women to be seen. The roots of my book are in my master's thesis, in which I studied women writing the 2007 election violence in Kenya. And between December and April, they were 15, um, I'd have to double check this, but 15 op-eds published about women that did not frame women as victims. 15 out of over a thousand. The traditional media in Kenya doesn't see women. It doesn't include women. When you switch on the television, they're presenters. They're what we call socialites. But as women who, as people who have opinions and people who can contribute to political discourse, it doesn't happen very often. And so what did we do? Kenyan women went online and started the hashtag, say no to manals. Do you know what a manal is? It's a neologism, it's a new word that combines man and panel. So whenever you have a panel that's all male, we, we call them a manal. And every time there's a manal on television, someone takes a screenshot, someone uses the hashtag, and the media is forced to respond. Almost every single woman that you saw on television in Kenya during the election in 2017 was there because of the depth of social media organizing. There's a hashtag, there's a Google list. When a call is put out for people, women mobilize, and I'm saying this as a participant observer, I'm also in the group. We reach out to each other, we call each other, we try and make sure that if I can't go, the person who's going to replace me is going to be a woman. That's the only way that we've gotten women doing political analysis on television because the traditional media doesn't think of women as political agents. It's the same with LGBTI Kenyans. 10 years ago, if the government had banned an LGBTI film, most Kenyans would probably have gone, well, it's terrible, but what are you gonna do? 
right now the depth of organizing and mobilizing around this film, of letting people know that we will not go quietly, we will not let this film just be banned, and winning, it's winning awards in Cannes and we're not allowed to see it in our own country? Are you serious? The fact that the head of the censorship board has been forced to respond on Twitter, has been forced to issue statements on Twitter, it's the depth of organizing that's happening online. So that's the good news, that's the hope. Social media is changing Kenyan politics for the better. But then that's not really why we're here, is it? Now we have to talk about the other side of things. And it's important at this point for me to underscore that hate speech is not new. There's nothing new about this, and nowhere in the world should have a keener appreciation for that than here in Germany, right? Derogatory comments that are used to create a context in which violence against a group, I mean, you know, come on, <laughs> right? What is new and what social media makes new is the speed at which information travels. It's the insularity of the communication. The fact that I am able to find another group of people who share the same derogatory views and we can have a conversation between ourselves and not be held accountable for it because nobody else is privy to that conversation because it's happening in a relatively enclosed space. So the, the actual impact of hate speech on Kenyan politics online or social media, hate speech on social media and Kenyan politics is still up in the air. There's a lot of really good studies that are still underway because the election was only in October of last year. We're still analyzing the data. But this is where it gets interesting, and that's why I call it also lessons from Kenya. Right now, people in the US and people in the UK, and I guess here in Europe, uh, continental Europe as well, are panicking about things that we've been worried about for almost five, six years. And this is one of the lessons that I really want to underscore here for an important reason. It's a philosophical reason. When we think about technology, we often think about technology as something that happens to the developing world, that, you know, they just kind of, we're just kind of waiting and you give us social media and then, okay, everything's changed now. We put mobile phones in the hands of Africans and suddenly Africa is going to develop and everything's going to be great. We've been worried about hate speech since 2013. Cambridge Analytica has been active in Kenya since 2013. Everything that you're seeing that people are worried about, we've been living with for the last five years. And it's really important philosophically for political science and for political thinking to start looking at the developing world as a place of agency, as a place of decision making, and not just a place where people just things happen and it's all structures and it's all institutions. This study was conducted by Ushahidi. I don't know how many people here have heard about Ushahidi. Oh, two out of three in bad. <laughs> Ushahidi is one, of the, is one of the developments that comes from the 2007 election, post-election violence. It's basically using mobile phones to track incidents of violence and to build maps and in, to help first responders respond effectively to incidents of violence during crisis like the election violence. This is a 2013 study, and one of their findings, um, and it just, I just picked one um, from the study, but Facebook has proven to be the online space where most online users prefer to engage in dangerous speech. Does that sound familiar? It should. <laughs> because a lot of the conversations that we're having about radicalization and especially radicalization of young white men, are linked to Facebook, are linked to Reddit. This is Myanmar. Right now, the UN, this is one of the cases the UN has cited as an example of the impact of Facebook on hate speech. And they found a very strong correlation between the increase in hate speech on uh, Facebook, because Myanmar was a closed society, and then it starts to open up, 
for most people in Myanmar, because of the free basics program and Facebook, the number one way that they connect to the internet is Facebook. I hope this is all sounding very familiar. So everybody gets on their phone and uses Facebook as a primary source of information, primary way of, of, of getting internet. And then when the attacks against the Rohingya um, start to happen, the genocide begins to happen, you see a spike in hate speech in, uh, against the Rohingya on Facebook in Myanmar. We haven't had a study like this in Kenya yet. There's one that's underway, but there's a sense, there's a feeling of familiarity when we talk about things like this. And there wasn't a genocide in Kenya in 2017. There wasn't. There wasn't, uh, there was an outbreak of violence, but almost every single person who was killed by the police by, in Kenya between August 8th when we had the election and November 1st when the president was sworn in was killed by the police. That's an important fact. But there's a feeling. Those of us who were watching the spaces, we knew, we sensed. What did we sense? The conversation became very polarized and became very heated. A member of parliament in Kenya um, threatened to shove a broken glass bottle up the vagina of another colleague, of a female colleague, because she was in a different political campaign. When the head of ICT at the election commission was found dead, the same member of parliament had the picture of his car on his website. The language got a little bit tougher, people got a little bit meaner, the arguments got a little bit harder. And it made it really difficult to have constructive political conversations, especially with people that you disagreed with. And I can give you an anecdotal example. I got into a lot of, I'm a very political person, what can I say? I got into a lot of arguments with you know, friends, uh, colleagues about this election, and not necessarily about who we were voting for, but just to say, can we ask a little bit tough questions about the people who are standing up and saying they want to represent us? And I got into one conversation where I realized, hang on, you and I are not dealing with the same set of facts. You don't see Kenya the way I see Kenya. Your information, I had a friend who was highly educated um, lived in Nairobi all her life, and she was telling me that I'm not going to vote for that guy because when he goes into office, he's going to massacre all the people in my ethnic group. I said, what? Where did you get that from? From WhatsApp. The real danger with social media is the speed and the insularity. It's the fact that this information can be created and it can travel really fast and really get embedded into people's political discourse. And we are not able to track it effectively until after the fact. And we're not able to measure its impact effectively until after the fact. In 2007, local language radio station was fingered as the main culprit in triggering election violence in Kenya. We have 44 ethnic groups in the country, of which almost each one has its own language. Many of them are not intelligible to each other. One of the things that happened with the rise of democracies, we said, let's promote local languages because it's good for preserving culture. And it is. It's very good for keeping people connected to their culture. But in 2007, local language radio stations were being used to promote ethnic or ethnically biased or ethnically charged political conversations. And again, you see a similarity because most of us didn't know what was happening. My language, I cannot understand what was happening on, for example, Kikuyu language radio station. And we weren't paying attention to it because we didn't think it was gonna turn out to be a big deal. Does that sound familiar? It's a pattern that we've lived through and it culminated in the violence that we saw with a thousand people being killed. And so this time around, people were more wary of local language radio stations and more wary of social media and more wary of the content that was being put up there. 
these are these are some of the the real story of Kenya's post-election violence is not a direct line between hate speech and violence. It's not a direct line. It's not that people have these opinions and they give these opinions and then there is violence. Rather, it's the pre-existing conditions that are already in place in the society and what social media makes possible within those pre-existing spaces. One analogy that I like to use is social media is like salt, sodium chloride, NaCl. When you mix salt with water, H2O, almost nothing happens, right? It's a very stable reaction. When you mix salt with hydrogen sulfide, H2S, you get an explosive reaction. Like it just stinks. I don't know how many of you remember this experiment from chemistry class. It's a really violent reaction. And to me, that's really what we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about hate speech and social media and regulation. How local, the pre-existing context intersects with what social media makes possible with what kind of information and what kind of connections it makes possible. And to me, the lessons that we, we can glean from this intersection, from this experience that we've had in Kenya, start with that. that every context is different. Every context has vulnerabilities. And we have to understand each society before we start putting in place measures that are premised just on one society. Remember my, my, my theme was titled, my talk was titled Between Hate and Hope. There is so much good that's happening in Kenya because of social media. There's so much good that's happening. There's so much bad that's happening. And as I said, we're still trying to nail it all down, but we know that WhatsApp especially, what we call dark social, has had a really significant impact on political discourse, has heightened people's angst, I think is the best word, or ethnic angst, right? And it hasn't settled down yet. This is almost three months, four months after the election, and things are still very much up in the air. And the second lesson I would say is it doesn't have to be physical violence for us for it to be worthy of our attention. As an African and as an African political scientist, I always get frustrated that the only time we get Western media, Western analysts to pay attention is when there's a threat of violence. Had we been paying attention to Kenya, in 2013, arguably a lot of the issues that we're seeing right now in the US with Brexit and with the Trump election would have had more attention. Like I said, Cambridge Analytica has been active in Kenya since 2013. In 2012, one of their agents, um, one of their um, advisors was murdered in his hotel room in Nairobi and the police were instructed not to search his hotel room for two days. If that's not a red flag for a dodgy company, I don't know what is. This is 2012. This information did not make it to Western media outlets until 2018. Technology doesn't just happen to Africans, doesn't just happen to the developing world. There is agency, there is decision making. And when we think about regulation, this leads me to the point on regulation. I think sensible regulation is necessary because we've allowed companies, tech companies, to run these experiments and to run and to have these impacts in the developing world without any kind of... If this information hadn't come out, Facebook didn't volunteer this information. Someone was paying attention and conducted a study and went to the UN and said, hey, there's a problem here. And Facebook was forced to respond. We are living with these realities in the developing world every day. But unfortunately, when it comes to the point of regulation, you almost feel like you're completely alone. 
And why is that? Because in Kenya, for example, the government isn't interested in regulating social media for the good of Kenyan people. Just last week, we had a law passed called the Cybersecurity Bill. And it was supposed to be about things like this. It was supposed to be about data protection. It was supposed to be about protecting the country. It was supposed to be about cybersecurity. In the end, it was about punishing bloggers who criticized the state. The very first case, the very first threat that was leveled based on this law was a governor. I don't know if I should say this because I'm on camera. <laughs> but, you know, he was on a bridge. He was launching a bridge, and the bridge collapsed, and he fell in the water. And the journalist reported it. And he went online and said, I will have you fined for spreading, the governor said, I will have you fined for spreading the fake news that I fell in the water. That's the very first incident that the law has been used. It, remember what I said about context. Every context is different. We cannot leave it up to governments that have demonstrated that they do not have the best interests of their citizens at heart to develop the kind of regulations that we want. There has to be some kind of solidarity across transnational solidarity that broadens these conversations, that brings people from the developing world into the room as equals, it says what's happening on your end of the world and how can we help? Right now, the GDPR, I know it's annoying, I know all the emails, the general data protection regulations, it's, the emails are so annoying, it's the best thing that has happened to us. Because most of our information, most of the websites are filtered through Europe. And because they have a lot of European customers and things like that, Kenyan websites are being forced to improve the data protection laws. We don't have data protection laws in Kenya. We don't. People can collect your data and sell it to anybody. And the mobile phone companies do it all the time. So for us, this is a win. And is a great example of the kind of transnational solidarity that we would love to see more of the kind of conversations that see things as bigger than just what's happening in my particular country. Sensible regulation. And finally, agency. The impact of social media on hate speech is a story about agency, as is the story of technology in the developing world. What does that mean? It means people choose. People are making choices, and people are making decisions. And, you know, the video that uh, Joe was showing the, uh, before, it's about creating contexts in which people's agency can be well reflected in the outcomes, and in the policy outcomes especially. I often move in and out of the development space, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with this ICT4D. Have you heard of that phrase? ICT for development. I know, right? Um, and I get uncomfortable with this conversation because of the way it thinks about technology. Just put a mobile phone in every woman's hand in the developing world and suddenly everything will be fine. It doesn't think about structures. It doesn't think about power. It doesn't think about economic inequalities just says, more tech, more tech, more tech, more tech. Everything that has happened in Kenya since 2007 is the product of decision making at multiple levels. People at the government level decided to build structures. People, individuals go online and they decide to form new ways of being and belonging. And what does that mean for us in this conversation about hate speech? It means that, number one, when the point that I made about sensible regulation, social, the companies that develop these platforms can respond to pressure as they are right now with the GDPR. They can be made to build systems that work better for everybody. They can be compelled. The, the idea that because Twitter is working well in a certain way, let's not mess with it at all, is really dangerous. These guys have agency, and we have agency also. We can work together and try and take back this narrative of passivity and say, well, they're giving it to us for free, so we should just take it as it is. No, we have agency, and we can be part of framing and reframing the story. Um, I'm gonna stop there with a very quick analogy or 
anecdote. When you think about, when we find ourselves in a historical moment of crisis, it's very easy to panic and to think, we've never seen anything like this before. And I like to end on a reassuring note. Human beings have been on this planet for, well, let's say thousands of years. I'm not a historian. I'm not a, what do they call Anthropologist. One hour of sleep, remember. Um, this isn't the first time that we've been in a situation like this. And again, it's great that I'm giving this speech in Germany. And I think about the Gutenberg Press and the idea that suddenly everybody was able to write and it was going to ruin society forever. And there was Luddites and all the people who campaigned against um, making mass printing possible. That the true essence of scholarship was writing books down by hand. And there was a whole campaign to destroy printing presses and this panic, right? And there was some reason to be afraid because it did change the relationship between people and the written word. I feel like we're in a Gutenberg moment right now as a species, that there's a lot of change happening and it's happening really fast and there's some good things that are happening and there's some bad things that are happening. And we have to keep things in perspective and we have to keep our perspectives balanced with the realities of the situations that we live in, of our countries, of our societies, of our different ways of being and belonging. I don't think panic is constructive. I think there is a problem. I think there's reason to be concerned. But I don't think panic is constructive. Sensible, reasonable, meaningful, inclusive regulation. And I honestly think that we could be OK. Thank you so much for your time. Hello. Is this working? So, Nanjala, thank you very much. Um, yeah, there was quite some input. And also thank you for ending on a positive note. I, I personally really appreciate that because as I, I feel like you, like there's no, no re I mean, there might be several reasons for panicking, but it doesn't help us at all. Um, but like, Talking about the Kenyan example or the Kenyan case, do you see, I mean, there's obvious parallels to what happened with the Brexit and with the Trump elections. Can you um, maybe extrapolate a little bit of the differences? How was it different? Sure. Um, as I said, the companies that were implicated, Cambridge Analytica has been active in Kenya since 2013. Um, the main differences between what happens in Kenya and what happened in the US and the UK is, number one, there are fewer Kenyans on social media than they are. The US is the number, than they are in the US or in the UK. The US, I think, is the number one uh, market for Facebook, um, and the UK, I believe, is number four or number five. I'd have to verify that. Um, in Kenya, there are only 8 million Facebook users as of 2017, out of a population of 48 million. And most of those are minors, are people who are not able to vote. And so what we are, we, we are not seeing is the long-term impact of being exposed to um, hate speech. And there was a lot of memes, a lot of the similar, similar things was using memes and using um, websites, that, fake news, basically. Um, to shape people's perception. I don't think we're going to see the impact of that in Kenya properly until 2022, when the next election is scheduled, simply because of the age, age uh, issue. 60% of Kenyans are below the age of 35. Uh, most Kenyans, in fact, the, the biggest age group are people below the age of 15. Many of those people will be adults, um, in 2022, and I think that's when we really start to see more strong parallels. It's the sheer number of people who are not online, the difference in the size that I think made a huge difference in how and the impact that this had on political behavior in Kenya. And what was the lesson learned after um, that experience, basically? How, how did 
politics change where there, you mentioned a law that was just recently <laughs> um, put up, but like the last like basically 10 years, how did the yeah. sh political shift occur after that experience? Um, after the 2007 election or the 2017? 2007. And how, that did it, how did that influence 2017? The biggest shift that happened in the 2007 election, as I said, was in the media, in the traditional media. And the traditional media in Kenya has a reputation of being one of the most robust in Africa. The most read newspaper in Kenya is read 2.2 million times a day. It's the most, the, in comparison, the most read newspaper in South Africa is read 900,000 times a day. Um, for the longest time between 1997 and 2007, so the pro-democracy era, the traditional media in Kenya was at the forefront of being critical of the state, of putting information in people's hands, of trying to push for greater accountability. In 2007, with the violence and the internalization of this idea that we were too critical, if we had been less critical, there wouldn't have been violence, if we had been less feisty, they wouldn't have been violent. The traditional media pulled back and stopped being directly critical of the state. If you open a Kenyan newspaper, you, you'll see it now. There is a lot of stories, but there is a lot of blind items. And a blind item in, in journalism is basically a story that it tells you the story, but the story has no characters. So a minister was found in his office, you know, reading, I don't know, Harry Potter. I don't know if that would be a scandal, but <laughs> instead of saying minister so-and-so was in his office reading um, Harry Potter. So you see a lot of blind items, even with these corruption scandals, you'll see, you know, 150 million shillings was lost. By whom? Like, did they just put it down and forget that they had put it down and walk away? So it, the, the, the pullback is what really created the space for first for blogs and then for social media to become the main space where people can say, this person did X, Y, Z. This person has been implicated in the May scandal. This person has been implicated in this corruption scandal. But I feel like it's really important to say, and I have to keep saying this in a lot of presentations, social media is never going to be a substitute for traditional media. It's never going to happen. Why? There's no fact checking, there's no verification, there's no, all of these really important things that have to happen in order for media to be the fourth estate. That doesn't mean that what social media does is not important or is not impactful. It just means that it has to be taken in its rightful place. Um, and in 2017, I'll give you the final example to really underscore this tension. One of the things that came out of the 2007 election violence in Kenya was a commission of inquiry called the Kriegler Commission. And the Kriegler Commission basically said, look, if the election counting process was more transparent, politicians would not be so distrustful and they would not mobilize their people and they wouldn't be violent. So what you need to do is use technology in the election counting process. And once that is done, the elections will be more free and fair. And that is part of the reason why in 2017, Kenya had the most expensive election in world history per capita, $28 per head. Because we had biometric voter registration, we had electronic voter identification, we had an art, what we call the RTS, the results transmission system. We had, there was five different electronic computer-based systems that were rolled out for that election. And every last one failed. Every last one. And not just because of Kenya, the company that did the electronic voter registration is a French company, Otimo for Saffron. There's a lot of European companies that are implicated in, when I talk about transnational solidarity, these are the kind of things that I'm thinking about. The company that's been implicated a lot in the voter registration debacle is a French company. Um, and so more technology didn't deliver a clean election. <laughs> it delivered an expensive, failed election. And um, there was a moment in August we voted 
there was a little bit of police violence after and a lot of uncertainty. And September 1st, the Supreme Court says, you gotta throw that out, throw that election out and do it again. And I watched the proceedings and um, the lawyer for the Electoral Commission was in court and he said, look, this RTS, this results transmission system, which was report, was, you were basically supposed to vote, the polling station is closed, the results are entered in the computer, those results go up on the website and are transmitted immediately and anybody in real time can know exactly what's happening in the country. The media, traditional media, used those re results as a snapshot of what was happening in the country. That's what they were calling their exit polls. They were saying, the IEBC is saying 500,000 people in County X have voted and that's the result, yay. When they went to court, they submitted results that were different from what had been on television. And the opposition lawyer said, we did an audit and you've done the audit and you can see there's a big difference. And so the Chief Justice asked the lawyer for the IABC in court, he said, no, the lawyer first said, he said, um, Your Honor, those were not the results. The ones that had been on TV, the ones that had been in the press, the ones that everybody had used, the ones that were the, on the RTS. He said, Your Honor, those were not the results. And the Chief Justice said, if they're not the results, then what were they? And he says, oh, they were just statistics. <laughs> they were just statistics. The fact that nobody in the traditional media interrogated those results. And you know why the, the opposition asked for the audit? Was because Kenyans went on Twitter, they went to their polling station, they took a picture of the results from the polling station, they compared it with what was being reported on the RTS, and they said, this wasn't the result in my polling station. This wasn't the result in my polling station. And that's what gave momentum to the, I, to the opposition to say, we want a full audit of the results. So it's two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, more people pushing for accountability, more people openly criticizing the state, more people being vocal. One step back, the technology didn't, it didn't make anything freer or fairer, it just made it more expensive. It just made the failure more expensive. So, Vasek, before we open for also the audience to ask questions, um, so you also mentioned towards the end of your talk, it's basically everybody's um, responsibility. Can you specify a bit more, like, what responsibility do tech companies have? What's politicians' responsibility in direct regard? What's our own responsibility as, as the general public and individuals? Right. Um, for the tech companies, this is globalization. And again, I go back to them being forced to respond to European legal changes on privacy. I had to update my Facebook privacy settings because of a European law. This is the first time I've been in Europe this year, right? The fact is these tech companies, Google, Facebook, the big companies are operating on a level of international, and that is, it's like globalization but on a heightened level. That's good for us as the consumers because it gives us more room, more spaces to hold them accountable. The first hearing where the Cambridge Analytica um, team was grilled was a public hearing in London. It was the House of Commons and you can find that video online. That's when the red flag started to go up properly. And then once the British uh, government did it, then the Americans were like, hey, we want a piece of this also. And then the EU was like, hey, when you're done there, you know, you need to come over to Brussels and we need to have a conversation. Um, so the transnationality is something that we can also replicate in the way we respond to the challenges that are raised. And I bring this up especially in the context of these privacy, com these companies that mine our information and operationalize it and sell it and things like that, my government doesn't care. Real talk, they're the ones who are doing it. <laughs> they don't care about my privacy, they don't care about my data, but your government does. And so to listen to each other 
and to stay to be aware of what's happening on the other side of the world, what's happening in Myanmar with Facebook, and how can you here push your government to make these companies be more accountable? I think that's something that we can really collaborate across countries and um, boundaries on. Um, and I guess the last thing that I would put is, is agency, like I said before. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, the Nigerian writer, has a great talk, you might have seen it, on the danger of a single story. I don't know how many of you have watched this. It's a TED talk. You can find it on the TED website. Um, but the, the, the whole thing is basically that we shouldn't just buy into one narrative of a certain part of the world because it's easy. And the narrative of technology in Africa has been bought into because it's easy, right? In the, in the developing world, because it's easy. Nobody expected Facebook to be implicated in a genocide in Myanmar, because it's like, well, this country just opened up. What, what's gonna happen? And we were all caught asleep at the wheel. I think it's really important for us to keep pushing ourselves to see each other despite the narratives that separate us and that tell us that people in country X are not able to respond to things the way we expect them to. Um, you're working in South Sudan. If you tell people in political science that you're running a tech-based um, project in South Sudan, South Sudan is one of the poorest countries in the world. It seems confusing, and yet it's necessary because people have agency and people are using technology and unfortunately some of them are using it negatively and we have to respond to that too. So it's things like that. Um, this is a philosophical point. Don't resist complicated st stories, I guess is what I would say. Don't resist complicated narratives. Thank you. So back to the audience. Yeah, so your hands up, the gentleman in blue. Mike's coming. Hi, I can't it's, hear it's you. It's like me. Just put it, put it, yeah, hold it very close to your mouth. Hello? Oh. Okay, perfect. I know everything about uh, the problem you are you saying. You are saying about this problem of politics and something else. It's the same in Italy. It's the same everywhere. So it's not that depends the territory of the country, because country is um, nationality. That is mine, the territory is mine, this is mine, this is mine. It's capitalism, is the same thing, so. Maybe the choice is don't watch TV. <laughs> Come on, it's, I don't want to take shit in my heart, sorry. <laughs> in my brain especially. Read books or something else, no? The, the problem is not the politic. The problem is, my, is ours, of us. If we change our thinking, Yes, I say, no, I don't like your shit. <laughs> it's politics shit, uh, for democracy shit. Uh, <laughs> sorry, this uh, <laughs> is very, come on. But it's a uh, problem, the politics is another problem. I don't care, really. The, um, I don't want to show, his, the, I don't want to vote. For example, Trump or Clinton, maybe C Trump is better, because Clinton is, Super crazy. Uh, Clinton was the war of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herzegovina. Clinton is, uh, I don't know, is the same. Politics is a theater. Do you have a question to ask? Ooh. No, no question. Because there's I, more questions I, in the room. No, I say, is a question okay. too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, do we have another question on this side? And the mic is right behind you. 
Hi, my name is Renata. I'm from Guatemala, and you know, it was a genocide there, so it sounds very familiar. It's similar connectivity and so on. I'm very curious. Uh, I'm writing a book on digital colonialism, and, and it is uh, many of the things that you described are very familiar on my side of the world. And uh, concretely, my concrete question is, I am very interested if there's any study uh, connecting radio and uh, radio broadcasting mm -hmm. with how, how, uh, how we are, are kind of sometimes with positive messages and health campaigns, cross-pollinating social media to radio, to public radio and so on, but sometimes how this becomes an amplifier of what is uh, on the social media, how rapidly it com a combination of public radio or evangelical radio in some, in some cases and, uh, and the hate speech. Yep, thanks. Do we have another question? One second, two more, and yeah. I, now I hear myself. Thanks uh, for this really amazing keynote. I learned a lot, thank you very much. Um, and my question um, is directed to something that you mentioned, and I, maybe I didn't understand it right. Um, you said that a reaction of the media um, after the violence happening was um, to like really cut down on critical reporting because they felt responsible. And that to me very much sounded like a narrative uh, that the government would spread, that the media is, is responsible uh, for um, sparking violence because it sounds like it's a very much government-induced violence and that would be just uh, another turnaround of who's responsible to then also shut up the media to report about it. And so I wanted to understand like where the dynamics of that was and where you feel um, maybe it's even totally necessary that the media reports about yeah. the government violence happening and how you feel about this. Yeah, but I didn't completely understand the situation. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. And there was one, one more question in the back and then maybe... Um, so you've looked at different kinds of hate speech on different platforms, but I was wondering if you found a certain tendency on certain platforms, for example, where they got a kind of encouragement or positive feedback for inciting hate. Uh, for example, in 2010, uh, Twitter didn't have a retweet function, so you didn't have a necessary way of knowing if people agreed with your views. So has this shift gone for worse or better? Have you noticed a pattern? Okay, um, should we just all live under a rock? Um, I mean, you could, you know, this is responding to the question of should we just ignore politics? Um, you could, it doesn't change anything, but you could. And I think it, this is why I even brought in the Gutenberg moment, because a lot of people, their response to things changing very quickly was to withdraw from the society and say, well, I'm not, I don't need this printed press, it's just gonna make my life complicated. I think increasingly it's becoming, so the tech is so embedded in our day-to-day -day lives that increasingly withdrawing completely is going to be much more difficult. I say this I, as a person who, you know, in my country now, I have to register online to get a driving license, to get to start a business, to get a birth certificate, to buy a house, to sell a house, to buy a car, to sell a car. I have to register on a centralized government database. I cannot exist in Kenya. I mean, I could try. It would just make my life very, very difficult. I don't like it. I actually really hate it, but it, it just, it's one of those things. You could switch off the TV and never watch TV again and, and everything would be great, but it wouldn't change what everybody else is doing. It wouldn't change what everybody else is doing and then you would have a problem because everybody else would be operating on a different set of facts. That, yeah, sure. I would love to know how that works out <laughs> for you. Um, radio broadcasting. There's been a lot of studies on the connection between local language radio and political violence in Kenya. A lot, a lot, because in 2007, that was one of the things that was pointed to as this is a decisive factor. The fact that, and even in 2017, a friend of mine did a very informal, she wasn't even paid for it. She would listen to the Kikuyu language radio stations and just tweet what they were saying in English. And you really, really saw like, he swore so I can swear too, 
holy hell, <laughs> this is madness. That people were being fed information that had nothing to do with what was happening in the rest of the country. And, and the radicalization of individuals because of this belief of persecution, that everybody else is persecuting us, and so we should preemptively behave in a way that defends us from that persecution. So yeah, if you, um, we can talk afterwards and I can point you in the direction of some of these studies, but there's a lot on Kenya. Um, the media government, it is, you know, the, 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 you, it's difficult to distinguish the point at which the narrative is being created and perpetuated by the government and the one that it's coming from the media themselves. Kenya, the way the media is behaving is a mixture of self-censorship and censorship from above. We are not, by any measure, the most repressive media country in Africa, in the developing world, in the world. In fact, if anything, in East Africa, we are probably the most liberal. In Africa, I would say, with the exception of maybe Namibia and Ghana, we are the most liberal in terms of the number of outlets, the stories that they're able to cover, etc. But that's not to say that it's all champagne and roses. At least one journalist has been killed because of their work in the last five years. Um, because he was investigating the International Criminal Court litigation. Um, in February of this year, I don't know how many of you saw the story, we had a, three of the largest television stations were shut down for three days because they covered an opposition event. And their managing editors had to get what we call anticipatory bail. So you pay bail in advance because you know you're going to be arrested because the police were at the door of the media houses at midnight trying to have them arrested. Um, so it's a mix. There is a lot of preemptive self-censorship. There is also a lot of censorship that comes from the state. And there's a third factor that makes Kenya stand out. Because our media is profitable, ownership, this committee to protect journalists calls it fisking. And fisking is basically using money to threaten censorship. The largest advertiser in Kenya is the government. The largest advertiser on any media platform is the government. So they keep the lights on. And so when the government wants to keep a media house in check, they just withdraw the advertising. And they've done, they did it in February, and they've done it many times. They, that's how the censorship also works. The two largest media houses in Kenya, the Nation Media Group and the Standard Group. The majority shareholder in the Nation Media Group is the Aga Khan, followed by the Moy family, the former president, the authoritarian president. The largest shareholder in the Standard Group is the Kenyatta family, the current president. So <laughs> there's a lot of these interactions and it's very complicated, but overall it's a mixture of self-censorship, it's a mixture of censorship that's coming from from the state and you end up with this weird behavior where they can be critical but not too critical and they can be open but not too open and then as a consumer you really don't know what you're getting and it's reflected in the sales because people are trusting them less and less and less and less and less. Um, oh, the different platforms. This is where it gets interesting for me as an analyst. Um, People use Facebook as if it is, I, I, I showed you the Umati study. People use Facebook as if it's a closed network and they think that they're just talking to their family and to their friends and people who know them. And for some reason that seems to make, empower them to be more toxic in their speech than they are on Twitter, which is nominally an open platform. So you don't even have to have a Twitter account to read what's happening on Twitter. And that's why in Kenya, at least according to the study, is Facebook has been, to date, fingered as the number one space where hate speech travels fastest. The study on WhatsApp is still in the works, and I think you're going to find that WhatsApp is worse. Because WhatsApp really, people treat it like it's text messaging to a closed network. I know everybody in this group. Um, but the multiplier effect is, I'm in a group of 300 people, 
I mean, two groups of 300 people. So I put the meme here, and then those 300 people put it in groups, 300 groups of 300 people. And that's how there was a meme called the real Raila, which was basically saying that if you voted for the opposition, the leader of the opposition, you were voting for, what do they call him? Lord of War, that he was going to start wars and he was going to drive Kenya into poverty. That was the main platform through which some of these memes were being transmitted. But f from an analytical perspective, WhatsApp is a real trap because you can't measure anything. You know how many people are on there. You can maybe say, I will try and measure how long it takes for it to go from this person to this person in northern Kenya. But what are you really measuring? Um, please don't take this to say that I'm saying Brazil was right, censor WhatsApp. I don't believe in censorship at all. It's just to say that WhatsApp has presented a lot of challenges. And the other thing is that you get it for free. WhatsApp doesn't use data in a lot of African countries and a lot of developing world. And Facebook doesn't use data in uh, Myanmar with the free basics. That was part of the problem is that because it's cheap and or free, people just feel more liberal with using it than they do when they have to like set up a blog and pay hosting and pay all of that stuff. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, so we do have time for one or two more questions. Is there more questions in the room? Otherwise, um, I think we can concede here. And it's, it's been like very insightful, as um, also the audience said, and I found myself. Thank you very much, Nanjala. And from what I know, the program con um, continues at 7. And maybe, Tatiana, do you want to say a few words? So thank you very much, both of you. It was really interesting. And I think now we have a lot of more knowledge after this. Um, I just wanted to announce that uh, in half an hour, we should go back here. We will have a panel about uh, Cambridge Analytica and uh, data profiling and also the uh, countermeasure that we can imagine about uh, that issue. So please come back and uh, we meet, uh, I would say, at 7, uh, seven five here. Thank you.